Great, so I'm here to speak about hydrogen today with the and in particular South Australian government and, and the industry's interest in uh, renewable hydrogen as a, as a carbon free fuel for the future. Um, my particular uh, background with hydrogen stems from uh, an interest in, in uh, and personal passion for decarbonisation and, and climate and uh, I've been quite privileged to work in a team with uh, South Australian government low carbon industry development where uh, we in fact are focused on communicating the, the positive opportunities of South Australia's renewable energy development and um, it's something that I think we, we can feel quite proud of and, and certainly there's an economic story to be told in that transition and I'd like to spend this, this sort of the first part of the presentation talking through our transition. I see you next. Great, so I'm sure many of you may be already aware of the, of the transition that we've been on, but um, certainly it's nice and it, it, to, to remind people, <coughs> so it's important for the context of why uh, we see hydrogen playing a potential role moving forward. So we're currently uh, moving it uh, from 0% renewable electricity, effectively, in the early 2000s to 50% renewable energy penetration. And uh, AMO certainly see that deployment accelerating whereby we expect to be uh, well over 60% in the coming years and, and in the near future. And we have a, a, an incredibly strong pipeline of projects, over 40 projects announced for redevelopment of a renewable nature in the state, um, largely due to uh, obviously a significant land size with a good, strong solar and wind resource at that land. And, and also, we, uh, we're quite proud of making it easy to develop uh, large-scale renewable energy projects in South Australia with uh, strong community acceptance by and large. Uh, this uh, is sort of a graphic demonstration of all the, how significant the, uh, the transition has in fact been with um, three pie charts, one in the early 2000s, one in the, in the last year, and and an AMO forecast for 2024-2025. And what you can see, what you can see uh, in the pie chart on the left is that coal uh, being red. How does the colour look okay there? Yep. Uh, so the, the red has effectively been displaced by, by green to, to this year, over the last uh, 18 financial years, uh, which is wind. And then the, the biggest transition we're saying gas in uh, the light blue still plays a similar role. Um, and it is an important peaking fuel for us. But, uh, the other sort of important bit to note there is what was net import in the dark blue has now significantly shrunken and that in fact was export. So last year was the first year we exported uh, to Victoria. Um, and uh, we see the exports growing and as well as that we see that uh, commercial scale solar will certainly increase. So um, obviously quite well um, being this organisation that solar rooftop has been enormous for South Australia and presently about one in three homes in South Australia is, has got rooftop solar so that um, accounts for that chunk in uh, light yellow there. Uh, this is sort of uh, more focused on the uh, large scale renewable energy generation story so you can see uh, in the early, uh, sorry, 2004, uh, we had Starfish Hill come online and, and from there we've really grown uh, year on year, every year since, with uh, now, uh, I think it's 22 wind farms in South Australia, and you can see the, the pink it demonstrates uh, on sale power reserve, the, the big battery that um, has received sort of worldwide acclaim. Uh, growing uh, sol uh, storage technology and also uh, the yellow is commercial solar starting to come in online with the significant decrease in PV panel technology, meaning that it's become really a uh, more commercial enterprise. Um, this is a bit about the, the pipeline moving forward in terms of large scale renewable electricity uh, generation and you can see where predominantly it has been investment in wind 
Um, we, we're now looking at, and sorry, the, the colours have changed up, but the wind is in blue, and then you, you probably can't read, but we've got solar PV in yellow, and then storage is, is that green. So you, you can now see that uh, investors at a large scale are much more interested in, in storage technology uh, to help with that base base load renewable energy profile that we're all striving to seek here in South Australia and also and also solar is telling or playing a much larger part. Uh, interestingly, um, the size of the pie there is reflected the uh, scale. And so what we have on the right hand side is is over times bigger um, sort of generation and, and uh, investment compared with what we have existing today. Uh, obviously, the enablers, uh, wind turbines have come down 50% in the last 10 years, as have PV prices. Uh, sorry, 85% on PV prices. So this uh, this is a fairly recent chart from the International Energy Agency. They um, have just re released their World Energy Outlook in the last week, and um, they really do tell a, a strong story story for South Australia becoming a leader in terms of the uh, international take of renewable energy. Um, this is actually a graph from a slide deck that they used in Korea a couple of weeks ago at an international renewable energy conference. So um, recognised internationally, um, we're quite proud to say, and you can see we're up there with, with Denmark, and um, it may be difficult to read those colours, but um, we're being recognised as as being in phase four, where variable renewable energy makes up almost all generation in, in some periods. Um, I've got a quick chart to demonstrate how that's working in our state. This is now from three weekends ago where we have that lovely South Australian uh, weather where it can be windy and sunny at the same time and also uh, particularly around the weekend, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, uh, we may have less demand, particularly from industry on the weekend. So you can see um, at a certain point on Thursday, we reached 140% renewable energy, 165% uh, renewable energy generation over demand on, Saturday, uh, on Friday. And then on Saturday, we, we reached for a momentary point in time, 200% renewables, which is a terrific story. I think um, the South Australian government is, is certainly recognising um, that this is an opportunity for the state and a uh, stated objective of uh, our minister, the Minister for Energy and Mining, Dan Van Holst Pelican, is to reach net 100% renewables in the 2030s. So we're certainly on trajectory to do that at, at certain periods of time. To do that all the time over 365 days is, of course, the, the next challenge for us. Speaking of some of the challenges, uh, there are um, there are circumstances where we are spilling wind and perhaps not getting full efficiency from that spilt wind, which is growing uh, year on year as per the, the chart there. Um, as, as I'm sure solar and, and probably um, advocates for, for battery and home storage, you'd certainly also be recognising uh, the challenges presented by the duck curve in South Australia, um, known for its shape. I suppose if you look at the little tail, then back and then heading up towards the head. So um, th that's that's happening now. And there are times when we're um, certainly starting to see no net demand and things like the Hornsdale Power Reserve is actually being paid to charge the battery. Um, similar opportunity at a home scale and hence the, the reason for our focus as a government on things like the home battery scheme and also increased storage throughout the state. Moving forward, we are seeing that the duck curve may become more like a, a giraffe or a swan. So you can see, um, I think that's down to, oh, that's quite far into the future. So 2036, that, that red line that's most um, extreme, but, but certainly uh, if we continue on this trajectory, we will be faced with the challenge of managing excess electricity and, and what then to do with electricity during those times. And uh, that's one of the things that we think about at the department. And certainly um, when you map opportunities to do things with excess power, then you can start to open up your thinking about what opportunities there might be that might not have existed in South Australia previously. And 
certainly uh, it's uh, being in now a net exporter into Victoria, we're looking at new markets and uh, the interconnector into New South Wales is one such opportunity. Um, there's also the thinking around hydrogen, which is of course the reason for my talk with a big in, uh, interlude previously, but um, the opportunity to, to export sun and wind to other countries to help with their decarbonisation is certainly something that we're actively pursuing through the action plan I'll speak to shortly. Um, electrifying domestic transportation is a, is a focus and um, that we wouldn't want to pick winners. We think there's certainly room for, for both in terms of uh, battery electric vehicles and, and potentially fuel cell electric vehicles. Um, and we, I, in, in many ways it, it would likely be horses for courses in terms of use and outcomes in terms of technology that industry and consumers will adopt. Uh, Decarbonisation of the gas networks is certainly an opportunity, again, using either hydrogen or, or biomass. Um, as we've seen with threat in electricity, we have been quite successful in decarbonising the electricity industry and perhaps gas could be the next frontier as um, technologies like hydrogen could help couple sectors and make them, uh, I guess, more fluid in between uh, the two. And then uh, there's, there's an industry attraction piece in terms of renewable energy where um, countries around the world are starting to, and companies around the world are starting to see the benefits in decarbonisation in terms of energy intensive industries. If you think about mining, BHP's interest in electric vehicles, for example, to, to help decarbonise their fleet or perhaps to prevent having to buy expensive diesel or in difficult or hard to reach locations in the state. Uh, minerals processing similarly, so you've heard Gupta speak about greening the steel uh, operation at Wyala uh, and the investment in renewable energy that's gone along with that. And uh, finally, things like data centres where they're extremely energy intensive and the demand for data, as this modern age tends to um, sort of use more and more of it, is growing exponentially, so could that be an opportunity there? So I'll now pivot into the specific opportunities being hydrogen and um, it, it's probably, uh, I'm speaking to an educated crowd but it, it, it's certainly useful I think to start with the basics so I'll spend a few minutes talking about where it fits uh, in terms of the way, uh, the slide from the Australian Hydrogen Council, uh, the Australian peak body for hydrogen. So. It's, it's obviously the most common substance in the universe, number one on the periodic table, and uh, when you use it, uh, it has no greenhouse gas emissions associated with it in its pure form. Uh, it can be produced from many energy sources, and uh, I've got a later slide to work through the main uses, or sorry, main production hydrogen. Uh, uh, but in particular, when used uh, when using electricity, uh, you can split H2O uh, using an, a process called electrolysis to, uh, I guess, separate the oxygen from the hydrogen and, and capture it. Uh, when it is captured, and it can be stored in a tank like, like any other gas, um, and it, it can be um, compressed, and it does, uh, in certain have a higher energy density than, uh, for example, lithium-ion batteries. And when compressed using quite a lot of energy, it can be liquefied and uh, in a similar process to, for example, LNG, and at uh, its liquid, in its liquid state, uh, it's, it's obviously more dense and can be transported more easily. Uh, so the next slide is about how hydrogen is used. Um, presently, and, and for a long time, hydrogen's been used uh, for a range of uses. Um, primarily as a feedstock uh, for industry, so things like uh, petrochemicals in industry, um, metals processing and the like. Uh, we don't have any hydrogen production in South Australia at present, uh, so uh, if you take GFG, they, they currently they truck in hydrogen from the east coast. Uh, to secure their hydrogen needs. Um, if you think about towns gas going back um, and still in use in some countries like Singapore, uh, that's made from uh, gasified coal and uh, towns gas has a around 60% hydrogen in terms of content. So 
really nothing new in terms of a substance that we we deal with. We work with it quite frequently, but um, it, it's in some ways also a return to the future, or back to the future. In terms of uh, uses for energy, uh, in addition to the town's gas example, there's transportation. Uh, so electric vehicles is one example of uh, potentially the future for uh, um, electric transportation, along with lithium ion and other battery types. Uh, so there's uh, two sort of main pathways for how hydrogen is produced. Hopefully this is better. So uh, two main pathways for hydrogen's production, uh, one being the traditional and, and the second being the emerging. Uh, traditionally, um, hydrogen has been produced using either the gasification of coal or through uh, steam methane reforming using uh, obviously methane in that process. And that's uh, demonstrated at the top uh, sort of pathway on the presentation. So either coal, water and oxygen gasified and then uh, you, you can produce hydrogen with, with carbon dioxide being uh, a resultant product in, in the case of coal and, and similarly with natural gas. So natural gas, water, oxygen, sea methane reforming and, and carbon dioxide. Now it may be more complex than that, um, but I think for the purpose of the slide we'll, we'll run with it. Um, there is uh, obviously when you're producing hydrogen using fossil fuels you will get carbon as an output and there is work underway uh, around the world in terms of CCS uh, to try to capture that carbon and then to uh, store it underground or in, in other ways. Um, one project that is looking at that is in Victoria so there's uh, the, the picture that you can see on the right uh, top right there is a uh, computer gener generated image of a joint venture between the Australian government, the Victorian government, the Japanese government and, and industry. It's a five million, $500 million project to uh, produce hydrogen using coal, brown coal in the Latrobe Valley. And then they uh, initially will shore up a hydrogen supply chain between Japan and Australia, uh, which will include liquefying the hydrogen and then exporting it from Australia to Japan. Over time, they hope to be able to capture the carbon and then to sequester it into the Bass Strait, so the old, uh, well, not old, the ongoing sort of carbon net uh, project. So that's, that's one hydrogen project in Australia. Um, for us, it's been relatively simple because we don't um, have uh, any coal mining happening at the moment. And so, um, and obviously with our comparative advantage, in renewable electricity generation, uh, we, we're effectively um, focusing through our hydrogen action plan in, a, in what's known as uh, renewable hydrogen production through electrolysis. So the inputs to that are uh, solar, wind, any other renewable energy source you can think of, combined with water to produce hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, the bottom right is a picture of Hydrogen Park, South Australia. It's going to be located at the Tonsley Innovation District. The groundbreaking ceremony for that project should be hopefully next month. And we aim for that project to be operational by the middle of next year. Um, so that's um, going to be Australia's largest electrolyzer and a project that uh, we're quite proud to have co-invested in as a South Australian government. I can talk through that, how that project will run in a, a little bit more detailed later. Um, so hydrogen, as I've explained, is nothing new and its use as uh, a hydrogen economy has been a concept that was in fact uh, first coined by a professor of Flinders University in the 1970s, Dr. John Bokris. But uh, it, it has had a few sort of emergences and through sheer economics, it, it hasn't yet reached that point where it's, it's going to be commercial um, or it hasn't yet been commercial. But Recently, there's been a very significant push led by uh, countries like Japan who are exiting nuclear and they really do need uh, the next thing. Um, so, and I've got a, a slide to talk about that, but what it effectively means for Australia is um, a potential market for hydrogen produced using 
fossil fuels with CCS or alternately with renewable energy. So um, effectively what we have on this slide, and I appreciate it's quite busy, but um, it's some work by the Australian government in 2018 which sought to sort of qualify s Australia's hydrogen opportunity. On the left hand side we have, uh, I guess, uh, it's not quite a Venn diagram, is it? But we have three circles um, outlining the hydrogen opportunity for export. And there's, uh, you can see the three dot points underneath that are, are the three main transport vectors being considered for hydrogen, being in a liquefied form or as ammonia or alternately as another chemical, so methyl cyclohexane. It's a tongue twister I've only just managed to get my head around, but um, it's, an, it's effectively another, another vector in which hydrogen can be stored. And then when it, re it reaches its destination market, the hydrogen could then be stripped back out of that, that chemical. Uh, there are pros and cons to each um, transport vector, um, liquefied hydrogen, as its name states, requires liquefaction and hydrogen being light, uh, number one on the periodic table, means that it requires quite a lot of energy in order to condense it at minus 250 something degrees. So um, a, a large engineering challenge and requires a lot of economy of scale in order to get there. On the other hand, it's clean and it's quite pure. Alternately, you've got ammonia, which is an existing uh, industry with existing import and export infrastructure. Um, and so uh, quite quickly, there is much discussion and we, we remain agnostic as to how it might be transported as a government, but there is uh, some projects in Australia that are looking at ammonia as uh, perhaps potentially being able to get to market more quickly and with less, um, I guess, capital capital investment required being in an existing transport type. And then there's methyl cyclohexane, so uh, with ammonia and can be exported or imported using existing infrastructure. Um, and there are some projects, for example, the Middle East is, is exporting uh, methyl cyclohexane for hydrogen effectively uh, to Japan, I, I think this year as part of a demonstration. Uh, there's domestic use for hydrogen, so um, effectively hydrogen, like any other gas, burns and that's, it burns hot and that's part of the benefit to it, right? so it's a fuel. And so for cooking, um, industry, that type of thing, it could be quite useful. Um, as an energy source, it can also be used to fuel f fuel cell electric vehicles. So um, it, uh, fuel cell electric vehicles are just like electric cars in an electric drive chain, train. Um, some people assume that you burn the hydrogen in a fuel cell electric vehicle, but it's, it's not the case. It's, it's effectively a fuel cell is the, the opposite uh, reaction to electrolysis, whereby instead of splitting uh, H2O into hydrogen and oxygen, you're bringing it back together. And so um, you might see, if you look on YouTube, um, hydrogen vehicles will spout uh, water out of their tailpipe, and, and you'll even some, find some people on the internet who will drink that water. So. Um, yeah, I, I guess a complete uh, closed loop. Um, and then finally, and, and this is important for South Australia and, and some of the reason for my earlier context is it, it could be um, quite useful as a mechanism for making our energy system more resilient. So if you think about the times where uh, we do have excess wind and solar and we, for whatever reason, may not, the economics may not stack up, export it, in, interstate, then potentially we could make hydrogen at those times. Um, it could also have benefits for, for remote grid, or if you think about mining industry, they may prefer to build 200 or 300, 400% renewable energy for what they need at certain times in order to produce hydrogen instead of trucking in diesel. Um, so you can think about the future where that might be useful. Uh, the economics of it all, uh, I mean, it's a uh, Economics are always tricky, but under the three scenarios, um, and, and I've chosen the, mid the medium scenario uh, for uh, the Australian government's uh, piece. We're, we're looking at a $500 million industry by 2025, and, and as much as $4.3 billion uh, by 2040, if uh, well, under a medium scenario, the, the hydrogen industry can scale to export.
Uh, in the state, we've been interested in hydrogen uh, for quite some time. It, it started under the previous uh, Weatherall government uh, when uh, Tom Coutsantonis was uh, energy minister and uh, it was uh, sort of replicated in what was known as the hydrogen, uh, hydrogen roadmap for South Australia. Uh, at the time, it was uh, a quite a forward-thinking uh, roadmap, uh, the first roadmap of any jurisdiction in Australia, and we based it on some techno-economic modelling, a uh, piece of techno-economic modelling that we did. Uh, you can find that uh, study still available on our website. And um, to, to the immense credit of uh, the, the new uh, government, the Marshall, Stephen Marshall government, uh, we're very pleased to have had the opportunity to go back and revise uh, and, and work on South Australia's Hydrogen Action Plan, which uh, we think is, uh, really does tell a good story about the, the journey we've been on the last couple of years, and um, we're quite pleased that the, the Premier, uh, Stephen Marshall, announced the Hydrogen Action Plan at the International Conference for Hydrogen Safety at, um, in Adelaide in late September. Uh, it was an extremely well-attended conference by, um, I think, over 200 delegates from all around the world, and the first time that the conference uh, has ever been held in the Southern Hemisphere, so quite a good nod to the journey that we've been on so far. Um, I've already talked to to this um, quite a bit, but I think um, this is a, a basically a centrefold for our hydrogen action plan, and it demonstrates where we see hydrogen may have application moving forward. So you can see uh, solar, wind. And, and potentially rooftop solar PV, given our duck curve um, discussion earlier, becoming a swan uh, into an electrolyzer and being stored for uh, so liquefaction or, or conversion for export and potentially for mining, industry and agriculture. Um, tra transportation either using a tube trailer facility, which is the current way that we import hydrogen from other states or uh, blending into an existing pipeline for transportation or indeed to decarbonise the gas network. Uh, end users, uh, I, I've talked through, so I, I won't spend any more time, except for potentially electricity. I may not have mentioned that um, being a gas, hydrogen burns, can turn a turbine and, and in fact produce electricity. So you could have um, peak peaking hydrogen plants and in fact one of the projects that is looking at South Australia, the, the Port Lincoln uh, Renewable Hydrogen and Ammonia Supply Chain Demonstrator is, is looking at Port Lincoln as the end of the NEM and a significant opportunity potentially to pro provide peaking power into the town of Port Lincoln uh, through 32 megawatts of 100% hydrogen turbines. Um, when it comes to hydrogen, uh, we feel that our real comparative advantage lies in our natural resources. And, and by that I don't mean what's under the ground, but in fact above the ground and, and cannot be exhausted, being wind and solar. So uh, what this chart demonstrates is um, a, a wind and solar overlay of Australia based on our geospatial modelling. So what we have is in the middle of Australia, I'll see if I can give this a go, excuse me, in the middle of, oh, that's, that looks quite poor on this projector, doesn't it? So, um, so sorry. Um, um, yeah, so if, we'll, we'll have a go at that. That's a good suggestion. Thanks, Sean. Um, what you can see is the best solar in Australia. And uh, what you can't see is uh, perhaps not. Uh, we've got effectively, I'll explain it, and I'll, I'll, I've got the link to the website so you can take a look, but effectively three bands of solar, and overlaid we've got two bands of wind resource, and when uh, in blue, and when the, when the blue and the yellow intersect, you, it makes green, and we think green is an ideal place to produce hydrogen because you're not just relying on the solar curve or a wind curve, you can actually overlay them. And the beauty of that is um, demonstrated on the next slide, which hopefully you will be able to see, is uh, our hypothesis based on our modeling for how we can produce hydrogen at scale 
uh, uh, cheaply and in fact uh, over the longer term we aim for it to be more competitive than fossil fuels which is by uh, overlaying those two resources and this is a uh, Cooperpedia uh, EDL's project at Cooperpedia um, but I, I, when you combine wind and solar in certain sites we believe that you can run your el electrolyzer over 65 percent of the time and depending on the site up to 85 percent of the time when paired with certain storage icons <laughs> like rookie you see in the back there <laughs> and um their aim therefore is to overcome a high capex and ultimately uh to produce a, a smaller unit cost for hydrogen obviously a key part of that story is the cheap uh, electricity that you're producing and a uh, high use of the electrolyzer. So that's that's the hypothesis, and and we're working hard. It it won't be an overnight industry, as as we've seen with with in fact solar and and wind industry themselves. But uh, we believe it's it, it's a journey that is worth investing in. It has, uh, I guess, public value merit to it, and we're starting at a at a small scale with targeted uses for hydrogen. This project is a is a larger um, pitch the the Tonsley Innovation District Hydrogen Park SA that I spoke to earlier. It's being led by Australian Gas Networks, and their their driver is uh, the Gas Vision 2050 report, whereby they and and other gas transmission companies all all aim to be carbon free by 2050. Um, this project is an 11.4 million dollar facility. Uh, it receives $4.9 million in, in state government investment. And what they're going to be doing as of the 1st of July 2020 is producing hydrogen uh, in that shed. Uh, it's a Siemens electrolyzer, 1.25 megawatts. They'll be uh, venting the oxygen, which is a good thing for the atmosphere. And they'll be capturing the hydrogen in that tank and blending it in the existing gas network. Uh, the, the blended hydrogen will be in small quantities, so only up to 5%, and it will go to, uh, in first instance, 700 homes in, in nearby Mitchell Park, so just over the, just over the road from, from Tonsley there. Uh, they've been, uh, I think they launched community engagement some months ago now, and um, there's the opportunity you all to, to visit the website. It's uh, blendedgas.agn.com. Uh, there may be a .au, but <laughs> um, blendedgas.agn. If you search that on Google, you'll find it. So they've got quite a lot of fact sheets and um, opportunities to engage, sign up for the newsletter and all that kind of stuff. Uh, that's quite an exciting project uh, because it will be Australia's largest electro electrolyzer. And we like its location at the Tonsley Innovation District because it's adjacent TAFE, uh, the Flinders University, and a lot of um, cutting edge, I guess, R&D and plug and play uh, features at Tonsley. If you've never been there, I encourage you to. And certainly um, there is the opportunity to understand and to learn about how the electrolyzer performs with respect to the electricity market and also how they can potentially couple those sectors. Uh, so this is, is looking forward to the future and this is where we see um, hydrogen could scale up and, and in fact be quite a, a great economic opportunity for the state and that's through export. So uh, this is Iron Road's image. Uh, it's at Cape Hardy that they envisage a deep water port for, for export of their iron ore and they recently signed a, a heads of agreement with H2U, uh, the company investigating Port Lincoln, uh, to um, consider hydrogen export as part of a multi-use uh, facility. So. Um, a, a potential export uh, opportunity in there. Um, I'll, I'll just finish on the, the themes of our action plan and I, I apologise I don't have physical copies. We had IMARC a couple of weeks ago and, and then um, a range of other um, delegations come in. So um, I, I implore you all to check out the action plan on the website and, and please feel free to get in touch if you'd like a physical copy, we expect them in the next week from the printers. But um, that's 
it might be a little bit blurry, but effectively we're focusing across five action themes with four actions underneath them. Uh, facilitate investment in hydrogen infrastructure. Uh, establish a regulatory network that's obviously has community confidence and, and as well as that industry um, needs to be simple for industry to come in. Uh, deepen trade relation and supply chain, obviously a significant piece because ultimately we see uh, demand from overseas being a large driver for, for local industry here and uh, foster innovation and work for skill development. So some of the actions underneath that include um, being part of uh, the Future Fuel CRC, uh, the Australian Hydrogen Centre, we're quite proud, uh, will be announced, we expect, in the next couple of months. And uh, South Australia and Victoria are the only states to, to pioneer that, along with the Australian Government. And, uh, and finally, to integrate hydrogen into our into our energy system. So uh, I explained some of the drivers for, for that being the case uh, from a South Australian standpoint. I've got a few quick takeaways I'll, I'll breeze through and I'll try to leave some time for Q&A. Uh, so as I alluded to earlier, the hydrogen economy is, is not a new concept, but this time it seems to be taken with real gusto and, and be getting quite a lot of attention from some of the world's leading investment banks and, and uh, I, get, I suppose authorities on the matter. Um, one of the, the re and this is sort of my, my views, not necessarily the department views, but I think leadership from the top, uh, particularly from Japan and Korea, has been one of the, the large drivers for the renewed interest in hydrogen. Uh, both countries import uh, the, the vast majority of their energy and, and Australia for its sins is responsible for supplying a lot of that energy. Um, but they, they have at home large decarbonisation pushes. They're faced with uh, rising middle classes that are interested in air quality um, and, and, and the environment in terms of their, their footprint. Uh, they, they both have uh, meaningful uh, plans to use hydrogen and a lot of it is focused on actually hydrogen technology export, so helping the world decarbonise through use of hydrogen through their vehicles and, and other fuel cell technology applications. But equally, they recognise the need to import hydrogen that would become uh, would come from renewable sources. And uh, it, I, I suppose significantly also they've, they've backed, they've put their money where their mouth is and they've backed it in, in a financial way. So. Uh, I'm quite excited to watch the Olympics uh, in 2020 in, in Tokyo, where I understand the, the torch will be a hydrogen torch, and they'll have over uh, 100 buses on the road. Uh, they aim to have over 40,000 four, yeah, 40, vehicles in the not too distant future. Similarly, and, and not to be upbeaten, uh, Korea aim to have over 4 million uh, hydrogen vehicles produced by 2030, so a significant push. Um, sort of uh, second takeaway uh, from my standpoint, and this is a, a chart from the World Hydrogen Council, which comprises some of the world's largest oil and gas companies, uh, in including some of the big players, is, um, the re and, and this has been interpreted, I'm sorry, by uh, Morgan Stanley, in terms of the, the blue that I hope you can see, yep, is uh, hydrogen demand, and it projected hydrogen demand to 2050. And the red is the gig gigawatts of renewable energy that will be required to produce that amount of hydrogen. So you can see it's an exponential growth in renewable energy to supply. So um, what you may not be able to read is uh, in 2030, that is 250 gigawatts uh, required to supply uh, hydrogen, just even half of the world's hydrogen at that point. Uh, the NEM at present is 54 gigawatts around that mark. So you're talking at 250 gigawatts for 2030 supply of hydrogen, talking five times the NEM over just in generation. So down the track, you could envision a scenario where you may not even grid connect a, a large scale generation facility. You may just produce hydrogen at site, which may be close to uh, a shipping terminal for export. Um, yeah, I think that's the main things. 
there. Um, and I've got this horrible slide for your projector, I'm sorry, but, the, but I was trying to link it back to South Australia and, and where we see our comparative advantage. So um, we don't see that we will dominate Australia necessarily in terms of hydrogen production, but we'll, what we do want to do is provide a, a premium alternative to market. And um, we believe over the longer run, as the uh, economies of scale get worked out, and we've done it before with renewable energy, that uh, renewable hydrogen will be a cost-effective alternative, and in fact, a, a, a product of, of choice for international customers, as well as domestically. And uh, I suppose that goes with this takeaway in terms of uh, the need to scale up. So you can see uh, this is some work done by the CSIRO as part of their roadmap, and effectively what we have is a, a, a sort of a cost curve where everything above the curve across the time frame will be commercial now and everything below will require some more work so we hope over time that the costs of uh, electrolyzer technology to produce hydrogen will come down at the same rate as say for example solar panels 85 percent in the last 10 years and and solar nearly f uh, and winds nearly 50 percent in the last 10 years if hydrogen can achieve that then we should be looking at better scale and, and cheaper hydrogen as, a, as an end product. Uh, and then my second last slide is, is a sort of a an, an comparison with the LNG industry. And uh, for those that have seen Dr. Alan Fink, Australia's chief scientist speak of the National Hydrogen Strategy push, then uh, you will have heard him articulate this far better than I, but um, hydrogen like LNG, and they do have some obviously very close similarities in uh, in international engagement, trade relations, and um, a significant capex investment. Uh, it didn't happen overnight for the LNG. And um, as you can see, it took 10 years from the contracts to be signed for first export, and then again, a second phase of growth uh, some 20 years later. So uh, that sort of map seems to match up against what the World Hydrogen Council are, are saying. And um, finally, uh, the, a little excerpt from our hydrogen action plan is that's certainly how we see our focus as government scaling up. So uh, from first hydrogen production, uh, uh, sorry that green's not showing up too well, nor is the blue, but you can follow um, up sort of exponentially to, to export. So uh, first, first hydrogen production in the state, we're quite proud of having achieved next year, uh, touch wood. <laughs> um, and uh, we, we, we want to plug and play, get R&D outcomes, make sure regulation networks are, are secure and, uh, and attract investment in, in larger scale projects to couple with the decreasing costs over time. So thank you very much uh, for, for listening to me the last 45 minutes or so. Um, I um, do encourage you all to check out our website, hydrogen.sa.gov.au, and download a hydrogen action plan. And um, I'm very happy to take any questions you may have.